How do you use immunosuppression to slow multiple sclerosis? That's exactly what I'm going to explain in this video. MS disease modifying therapies that suppress the immune system for the win. Don't turn away because all of that starts right now. Hey. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. This video is the fourth in a series that I'm doing on MS disease modifying therapies. The last video in this series initiated a conversation on how these medicines work, their mechanisms of action. And we focused the entire last video on immunomodulatory drugs, drugs that manipulate the immune system. So if you missed that, I'll throw a card up above and you can check it out. This video will be laser focused on MS disease modifying therapies that work via immunosuppression. They suppress the immune system in some fashion or form to slow the disease process. So let's talk about those meds starting right now. Now within the immunosuppressive agents, there are some drugs that are chronic immunosuppressive agents. In other words, you're constantly dampening the immune system. And there's a couple drugs that are discontinuous and you don't chronically do it, you just induce the immune system, and then you walk away. So those are very different. So let's start with the chronic immunosuppressive agents. And these would be the anti-CD20s, or the B-cell depleters. And so these are medicines, uh, when taken in the human body, they identify adult B-cells and deplete them. They don't mess with the innate immune system. They don't mess with the T-cells. They're laser-focused on knocking down the B-cells. These include drugs like ocrelizumab, or ocrevus, ufatumumab, which is casempta, or off-label rituximab, which is rituxan. And the way these drugs work is really cool. Now, I'm going to explain it to you using an analogy. I graduated from Gehanna Lincoln High School, which was a massively overcrowded school in Columbus, Ohio, in the 90s. And there were 717 kids in my graduating class. In between classes, the hallways were super crowded. You have these big book bags and young clumsy teenagers are bumping into each other. And if two young men bumped into each other at Gehanna Lincoln High School, there was only one way to settle such a dispute. You would meet behind B building at 3.30 and beat the crap out of each other. Now, I attended some of these social events and what I noticed was when two young men showed up to defend their book bag honor, they always show up with at least a five or six of their very closest friends. Those friends are behind them and they get them all riled up. Go ahead, man, whoop his butt. I got you, I'll hold your book bag. And think for a moment about the scenario. Now, imagine that the young pugilist fighting, that's the T cell, which is going to attack your myelin. But the friends are the B cells and the friends are necessary to get the T-cell riled up enough to go attack you. When you apply a B-cell depleter, you essentially murder all the friends. You get rid of all the B-cells. So when the T-cell shows up to fight, and he looks around and none of his friends are there, he says, whoa, 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 I don't want to fight anymore. I was just joking. Literally, that's the way these B-cell depleters work. So when you take ocrelizumab, for example, and you deplete your adult B-cells, you disallow co-stimulation of the T-cell. You can't get this, the T-cell stimulated enough so that it attacks the brain and spinal cord and thereby the B-cell depleters massively slow down MS disease activity. Real quick before we go on, do me a favor. If you like this video, would you please give it a thumbs up? Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Those two actions teach the YouTube algorithm that you really like this content and help push it out so more people impacted by MS can benefit. Thank you. The next two immunosuppressive drugs that I'll be discussing are not continuous. They're not taken on a constant basis. They're discontinuous. They're taken for a short period of time and then you don't take them anymore. They both work uh, in many ways by an induction model. So they're getting in and changing the immune response so that it behaves differently thereafter. Now the first medicine I'll talk about is called Lemtrada or Alemtuzumab. And it's a drug that you take via infusion for five days in a row, then you're done for that whole year. And when you take that medicine, it identifies the adult B cells and T cells and it depletes them. So it brings them really low. And over the subsequent year, they slowly grow back. And then on the anniversary, 
you give the medicine for three days in a row. And again, you identify adult B and T cells and push them down. And then very slowly over a year, they come back. And by doing this two rounds of uh, immune reconstitution uh, or rebooting the immune system, you literally deplete these naughty autoreactive adult B and T cells in the cells that come back are more well behaved. If I was to use a war analogy, imagine that there's two warring nations and these guys sneak over here. They kill some of the generals and take their children back here and raise them as their own. And now they are generals for this, uh, this nation. And that's how you can get away with a durable effect in the absence of constantly treating someone. You can accomplish that with alimtuzumab limtrata. There's a second medicine, which also is discontinuous, so it's not taken on a continuous basis, and it also works sort of by an induction model. It's a drug called cladribine tablets, or Mavenclad. And I think of Mavenclad as micro-induction. So you're taking a pill by mouth for five days in a row the first month, five days in a row the second month, and then that's it for the whole year, so 10 pills the first year. Then on the anniversary, you repeat that process once. Five pills the first month, five pills the second month, and then nothing ever again. And so what you're doing there is you're identifying, again, adult B and T cells, but with Mavenclad, much more effect on B cells than T cells. So it's different than Limtrata. And you bring them down, but you don't bottom them out. You just kind of like pulse it twice. And then a year later, you pulse it twice. And in doing so, it's a micro-induction. It's like a micro-reboot where again, you change the cell lines. To give you an example, when you take Mavenclad and you drop your B cells, the B memory cells, which remember myelin as a foreign invader, don't come back very well. They only come back like 14%. So with these discontinuous induction therapies, you're literally removing some of the immunologic memory. It's pretty interesting stuff. So those two drugs are discontinuous immunosuppressive agents, very effective in treating MS, Limtrata and Mavenclad. Thus far, we've talked about several medicines that treat MS and are immunomodulatory, so they manipulate the immune system. We then talked about several very effective medicines that are immunosuppressive. Now, there's two groups of medicines that, in my opinion, don't fit into one category or the other very well. And these include natalizumab, tysabri, and the S1P1 receptors. So let's talk about both of them next. Tysabri is an infused drug once a month, and it does something really cool. It tightens that blood-brain barrier way better than the interferons. So if you go back to the three little pigs analogy, the normal blood-brain barrier, that's like the straw house. And I shared with you that if you squirt interferon on it, it becomes the stick house. But if you squirt Tysabri on the blood-brain barrier, it becomes the brick house, right? So like nothing can get through. And then you have to think about that song, oh, she's a brick house. Oh, mighty, mighty, letting it all hang out. All right, I'll stop. I'm not going to quit my day job. But nonetheless, Tysabri creates this massive barrier and almost no cells can get through. It's a better barrier. And if you disallow cells from entering into the central compartment, then they can't see the brain and spinal cord. They can't attack it. Now, this drug is, in my opinion, a compartmental immunosuppressive drug. What I mean by that is, when you take Tysabri, the peripheral immune system is completely and utterly normal, right? And if you have an infection, your peripheral immune system beats it up like normal. But because of this massive uh, barrier created at the blood-brain barrier, this brick wall, uh, she's a brick, around the brain and spinal cord, there are no white blood cells inside the brain. There's no immunosurveillance. So if a um, infection were to get in your brain, it's going unchecked. So inside the brain, it's kind of an immunosuppressed state, which is extremely effective to treat MS. But in that respect, I sort of view Tysabri as a compartmental immunosuppressive. The last class of medicines we'll be discussing in this video are the S1P1 receptor modulators. Blah, that's a mouthful. These are pills, the first drug, Gelenia or Fingolimod, has now been joined by three Me Too drugs, or second generation drugs. So these in include Zeposia, Ponvori, and Mazent. And all four of these S1P1 drugs work in a similar fashion. They're functional immunosuppressants in my opinion. When you take these medicines, they do something really interesting. 
they trick the white blood cells into becoming trapped in your lymph nodes and your secondary lymphoid organs. Think of the white blood cell as a car and the bloodstream as a road, so the car drives down the road, and think of your lymph nodes as a garage. So the car goes into the garage and then it goes out of the garage, right? And your white blood cells are constantly driving on the road, going into the garage and leaving the garage. They circulate through the bloodstream and the lymph nodes. Now, getting into the lymph node, uh, getting the car into the garage uh, is free to get in. So there's, there's no uh, guard that takes a ticket or anything. You just go in. But leaving the garage requires a hang tag called the S1P1 receptor. And when you take Gelinia or any of the Gelinia Me2 drugs, it causes your, your cells to engulf the S1P1 receptor. So now they, the cell doesn't express it. When the car goes in the garage and wants to leave, it can't find the hang tag. It can't find the S1P1 receptor. And so it literally gets trapped and cannot leave the garage. The cell gets trapped in the lymph node and it just sits there. It reminds me sort of of that old song by the Eagles, Hotel California, because you can go in anytime you want, but you can't ever leave as long as you keep taking the medicine. If you stop the medicine, the white blood cell expresses the S1P1 receptor, the hang tag, and then the car can finally exit the garage. But while you're taking the medicine on a daily basis, you keep your 80% of your white blood cells locked in lymph nodes. Now, if the white blood cells are in the lymph nodes, they cannot get into the bloodstream. And if they can't get in the bloodstream, they can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So in my opinion, Gelenia and the Me Too drugs are a functional immunosuppressive in the way that they work to slow MS. Tune into the next video in this series when I share with you my opinions on efficacy of disease-modifying therapies. Which ones are awesome, which ones aren't. Tune in for that video. And until then, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.